Um, okay, so we've not fulfilled the legal requirements. Um, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. And uh, I, it's my real pleasure to uh, introduce to you um, Gabe Brasto. Um, many of you know him already. He's a long-term collaborator here at the lab and co-supervisor of many PhD students. Um, there have been a fair number of interns, including one in the audience, I believe. Um, now already, Stefan, who's sitting in the back. Um, so, uh, so obviously we know Gabe, he's, he's a friend of the lab, and it's a real pleasure to have him here today to talk to us about uh, predicting 3D volume and stereo, uh, for volume and depth from a single view sometimes. So thank you very much, and uh, please welcome Gabe Bosco. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, wonderful introduction, and, and hello to, to all of you. Thank you for, for coming over. Uh, really, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, so I, uh, I'm going to talk about turning a single image into either a depth or a volume. And so that means I'm not going to talk about harmonic networks. Um, because if I did, then you would realize that you're using uh, convolutional neural networks incorrectly. And, and you wouldn't like that. You wouldn't want to um, know that you know, instead of using these kinds of uh, kernels, you should be using these kind of circular uh, harmonic kernels. Um, if you were using uh, our kinds of kernels, uh, you would get rotational equivariance, where equivariance is um, kind of uh, already baked into neural networks for translation. Uh, so if you have different input images, so here the image is just being translated. In feature space, uh, the, the different inputs actually look very similar to each other. They are just translated versions. And if you stabilize uh, some portion of that, you'll see that this isn't changing, uh, even though the inputs are changing. So you, this, this is great because it means that if you're doing tracking, you can still monitor the motion of an object. But when you're doing uh, recognition, the object isn't changing. That's not true for rotation. See here, when we rotate, the, the feature space representation is changing. Uh, and that's not great because that means that if I show you a dog and a rotated dog in feature space, it looks like two very different things. Now, lots of people uh, have tried to deal with that and try to work around it, but um, the, the work we've done, which I'm not telling you about, is how through <laughs> harmonic networks, we're able to um, give you rotational equivariance. And so what you're getting is, uh, after you stabilize, in feature space, you get this representation which if you compare to sort of the native CNN representation, you should see is actually quite stable. So showing you an image, rotated versions of the image, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It still looks pretty much the same in feature space. You have the invariant part and the kind of covariant part. Yes? Quick question. Can you deal with both rotation and translation? Uh, the translation part is already present in CNNs, and, and you don't lose that, although you do sacrifice a very little bit because of our constraining to those kinds of filters. So you still have rotation, you have translation, you now have rotation, there's a small penalty you pay for it. But, you're not talking about that. but I'm not talking about that. And, and one of the reasons I'm not talking about it is because, uh, this is a picture of my team from, from last year, so this is sort of at our, at our peak. Uh, you, as mentioned, you have Stefan here in the audience, so he's a brilliant PhD student and interning here for, uh, for the summer, and he is uh, the co-author of, of this work and can tell you in great detail a lot more uh, specifics about it. And this is, uh, and they're, they're presenting this, uh, he's presenting this at CVPR this, this summer. Um, these are the co-authors on that, on that paper. Uh, besides Stefan's work, which I'm not talking about, uh, today I will focus on the work uh, by Michael Furman on the right and Clément Godard on the, in the middle, both of, the, both of them supported by Oshin McKay. Uh, and for the two projects I'm going to talk about, first the first one uh, and then the second, we're converting a single image into something uh, quite cool. So in the first instance, it's converting a single depth image, like from a connect, into a volume, and then we'll convert a single color image into a depth. I'm not going to put these two pieces together. They're not ready for it yet. Uh, we can talk about that uh, afterwards. So let's get started converting a single depth image into a volume. So this is from CVPR last year. Uh, the kind of motivation for this is if you're uh, a robot looking at a scene like this and you want to understand um, where and how to grasp things uh, in, this, in this kitchen, if you uh, have the ability to take multiple views, right, multiple images or depth images, then obviously there are lots of ways to fuse that information together and get a 3D shape telling our robot 
where to reach. However, most robots, uh, are, when they're standing looking at a scene, they have a single view. They don't have multiple views. Uh, and so for them, when they look at the scene, this is what they get. They're getting a depth image like this with lots of holes because obviously the objects are, are sort of occluding the, the rest of themselves. Uh, and that leaves us uh, sort of uncertain where to grasp and, and if you're a robot navigating through a room, where to, where to move. And we would like to figure out the, the rest of the scene. We would basically like to get the kind of output you get if you had multiple views, but only given this single, uh, single input depth image. Um, so you'll, you'll figure out, obviously, uh, that we'll be using the multiple inputs for training purposes, and then we'll throw them away uh, at test time. Now, naturally, uh, there are some alternative approaches to this. You could say, uh, I'll just scan all the objects that might come up. Anything that I might need to grasp, I'll make sure I have a 3D model of it. I know what it looks like. I know its shape. Uh, and I'll just try to match that to that kind of messy single depth image that I started with. Uh, and that works fine. Well, it's not easy, uh, but there are a few solutions for it as long as you're only picking up and interacting with objects and scenes that you've seen before, so familiar objects. Um, other approaches include looking at symmetry. So you get a partial scan of an object. If you can figure out, and this is quite fiddly, if you can figure out sort of the, the central axis, then you might be able to revolve the front surface and, and try to reconstruct the rest of the shape. Now, that, of course, depends on making sure that you're picking up symmetric objects and that, that process of, of estimating the, um, the center of rotation. So symmetry is, is a little bit brittle, uh, except for certain shapes. Um, ShapeNets was uh, specifically going after uh, kind of semantic scenes and trying to do completion. Um, again, we're in the scenario of, of reconstructing objects that are from familiar classes. And so uh, we do compare to, to ShapeNets a bit. But, but it, in the end, it, it is a very kind of constraining situation uh, you have to be dealing with scenes that you, you've already kind of analyzed and trained on before. Um, and then there's Zhang's method, which uh, kind of has this nice heuristic, which says that most objects are convex. Um, and so if you, could seg if you could isolate in your depth image which objects go together, then you could fit kind of a convex uh, bounding volume and just label everything inside of that convex bounding volume is occupied, and there you have a, a volume reconstruction of the scene. And so, we, in fact, we compare against Zeng. Um, but you have to do this segmentation. You have to figure out which depth pixels go together uh, to then do that convexity, uh, apply that convexity heuristic. The thing that we really liked from uh, Kristen Grauman's group, from Kim and Grauman, was this 2D, all 2D uh, kind of insight that they had, which was that even for very, if you've trained on one class and you move over to a completely different class, if they were doing silhouettes and segmentations, there's a lot in common. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not always going to be that every car maps to every, every sheep or a person to a bottle, but for, if, you, if you train on a class of objects, the, the silhouettes are not so different. They just need a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of adjustment to be useful in another, in a completely different setting. And that's kind of the insight we brought to 3D. Um, and so here we'll start off with a nice simple example, kind of a blocky shape and a roundish shape. And already, if you saw this as a depth image, you should be thinking, oh, it's blocky on the front. You know, it probably doesn't extend backwards forever. Um, maybe it's blocky on the back as well. Uh, you know, maybe if it's yay tall, it's not, it's not going to be sort of um, minusculely, you know, super thin. Um, so you probably have some kind of uh, priors on, um, on what you think the shape could be in, in, in the back. So we'll take this as an example. Imagine that we're going to take a 2D slice through it. So through this, just imagine like a horizontal slice through this. So now we still have our, um, our uh, cylinder and our block there. Right? And we're just looking at, at voxels. Uh, now, of course, this is the ground truth. Right? When you actually point your connect at this scene from the bottom, right, then you just see the front surfaces, and you don't know what's happening in the back. So that gray area is, is unknown to us. Now, uh, in our process, both at training and then at testing, what we do is we run through the visible surface points and, and pick them at random. Uh, and we say, OK, there is a surface point. 
for that surface point, we're going to compute some feature representation by looking at its neighborhood. Uh, and this is, our, this is our description of our input. For that input, then, um, we're going to train a random forest, uh, a structured forest, in fact, for regressing an output, uh, or selecting, really, an output voxlet. So what you see here are these little boxes. They are patterns of how we think the back of that sampled point should look. So let me, let me kind of illustrate that. Right, we had this gray zone uh, surrounding this point. So it was gray in the back, it was white in the front because we could see past that point. But now what we've done is we've inserted the winning structured prediction here that says, ah, oh, behind that point we, we've trained and seen that normally there's a bit of space that's occupied followed by a bit of space that's empty. And so we plaster that into our, our output canvas. Uh, we'll repeat that process with a different sample point, insert a new prediction, and keep going. So we will just accumulate a bunch of these until we have this kind of volumetric estimate of, of what we think the backs of this, uh, of this depth image look like. So if you want to see this in 3D, right, you'd have a scene like this. The color is not available to our algorithm. We just use uh, the depth image as our descriptor, right? So it can work at uh, nighttime as well. Uh, and we take our sample point. Take the sample point, uh, make a descriptor around it, query, retrieve a voxlet. So now you can see it's a kind of a, a cuboid representation of what's occupied, what's not occupied. And here we're actually going to transform it. So it's in a canonical orientation but we're going to transform it so it's normal agrees with the surface normal of our sampled point in the image. And that's, that's actually kind of a, a useful uh, insight and trick. So then we paste that back in and sample another point, now the red point, paste in, paste in the voxel that goes with that, repeat until, uh, until you have basically accumulated enough of these. Now I mentioned the one trick, which is this reorienting of the voxlets, right? That way you don't have to have every shape at every orientation, uh, right? It is still a, a random forest, and even if it was a neural network still, uh, before HNets, they couldn't deal with rotation. Um, the other insight is instead of talking about it in terms of voxlets, which, voxels, which is what I was doing, uh, just think of them as sine distance functions, so truncated sine distance functions. And that actually works much better. So you, you have still this notion of what's in and what's out, but at any time, you just have to evaluate the, the zero crossings to figure out that, that surface representation. Um, but you also kind of know that the, the function means that you have points that know how far away they are from a surface. Uh, and so that, that helps. Yes? The normal only locks down two of the rotation. Ah, points. exactly right. Yes. So the, uh, let's see, do I have that? Uh, no, I don't have that here. Uh, the normal only locks down two degrees of freedom. And so the third one, um, is we align the voxlets to, we, we have a notion of what is up. So with the, we keep the same up vector for all of them. That's ex exactly right. And, and we went after tabletop objects from the, in the first place, so that assumption holds, right? It wouldn't hold for uh, other scenarios, you know, satellite images type, types of things. Um, uh, absolutely right. Now, to train this, we, we kind of set out and said, oh, well, you know, what data sets are available? Just download something and it'll be great. Uh, and Michael Furman had already, so this is the, the, the lead author um, on this, uh, now a postdoc in my group, he, he kind of set out and then overshot. So he, he actually maintains the um, RGBD data set uh, sort of listing and repository. So if you, if you search for RGBD uh, data sets, it, his, his page comes up uh, because he catalogs them and tells you like how big each one is and whether it has color or not and whether it is focused on people or tabletops or outdoor or indoor. Um, anyway, we knew authoritatively we, that the data didn't exist that we needed. And so we ended up having to, to capture our own data uh, and simply it was connect a bunch of tabletop objects and capturing lots of connect images and fusing them, uh, fusing them together. So we had our ground truth. We knew what some shape looked like from all angles. And we could take any one of those depth images as a potential input to our system where the rest of the fusion was, was kind of the desired output. Um, now we did this uh, pretty carefully to make sure that we had disjoint sets so that nothing in the test set, no objects in the test set ever appeared in the training set. So you shouldn't see uh, the same objects. Uh, there, I mean, there, you will see a box and a box, but, but they, shouldn't be, they won't be the same box, they won't be 
hopefully the, if it's a cereal box, you won't, it'll be like a raisin box at best, uh, you know, different proportions. It is actually fairly hard to come up with lots of tabletop objects that are uh, completely disjoint from each other, but, but we're pretty, pretty happy that we've accomplished that. And so our results are, are based on that kind of separation. Um, so when, the, when testing the system, we don't use the RGB input. So that's just for us to visualize what's going on. We do use that single depth image as an input. And then on the bottom right, I'll show the, the results. So there's, the, there's our computed volume representation. And I'll spin that around in a second. And the lower left, we have the ground truth. So what would happen if you had all, whatever it was, two to 300 uh, depth images fused together. So as you see, it's not perfect, but it is pretty good. It gets the boxes being boxy, the bottles being bottle-like. Uh, the floor is introduced here artificially. So again, we know the top and the bottom, and so it's just a, a, a heuristic algorithm that introduces the floor. Compare that to Zeng, which actually has the segmentation of all the objects, right? And we're still, uh, we're still looking better. One of the reasons this scene is so cool, and this one is, as, as well, is in the depth image, these objects are actually occluding each other. So it's not just a single, like, oh, see an object, fit a round shape, you're done. Uh, you're seeing an object, and you're seeing sort of a hovering set of, of points, and you're having to complete the back and the bottom and, and the sides as well. So there's a lot of sort of unknowns when we, when we send in one of these depth images. Um, and the system is, I'd say, far, faring pretty well on the, on the intended class. Uh, now, besides just looking at this qualitatively, we also needed to, to evaluate. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, so the, the representation you get is, is some sort of uh, estimated probabil probability that, that a given voxel is, because so you're, you're, you have overlapping things that you put on top of each other, right? Yeah. So how do you end up with sort of whether it's in or out from that? It's, it's, uh, so it's a, what we have is a signed distance function being projected. So each, each return from the random forest is a signed distance function. Uh, so each point that you evaluate in 3D, you, you can say if it's near or far from zero. Or if it's positive or negative, that means then, if you're then, inside then, or out. Then you have overlapping ones, so then you average that for each? So we're averaging. Okay. And it, averaging isn't that smart. It leads to some kind of smoothing that, that we're not happy about. Uh, but let's say taking small steps away from averaging without being too clever, we didn't get improvements. And so that is something I would hope to improve, but we couldn't find like a, an easy way. It was sort of a nice plateau where, where you'd have to climb a bit, quite a bit more to, to get something smarter for fusing. And then for the, the images on the previous slide, so then you're just thresholding that function? Is that the... Yes, so you, you, yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, for numerical analysis, to, to, to be apart from the qualitative, uh, we had to come up with our own kind of scheme for, for, for scoring ourselves. Because, you know, the predecessors had said, well, you know, it's kind of neat, isn't it? And, and we needed to, to, to put numbers to it. So we said, okay, well, we're going to take everything inside the camera frustum. You know, only, only, we're going to only evaluate points inside of that. And we're going to define the room extents. So somehow we know sort of the, the wall and the, uh, the floors. And so only points inside of that and behind the connect scan. Because the points in front of the, the depth image, obviously we know those are empty. So no points for getting that right. Um, and so this is the evaluation region is what's, what's happening inside of that. So you can look at intersection over union. And that's, that's really kind of the main one. Um, and so you know, numerically we win on, on IOU and on recall. Uh, we don't win on precision. Um, although I, I think the, that precision is... Uh, that we could discuss that a little bit. Um, also, the baselines that we compare against have the ground truth segmentation. They know that someone has gone in and said this, these depth points correspond to a separate object. That's a bottle. Um, we don't say it's a bottle. Well, no. For these algorithms, we don't say it's a bottle. Uh, and so then you can do a bounding box fit to just those points. And every object is sort of pre-segmented for us. Uh, and, and so that's how the baselines work. And we still, we still come out ahead um, for, for these types of scenes. Now, if we move away from uh, desktop scenes, which is not what we were intending initially, uh, right? Everybody was kind of interested to say, oh, you know, would this work for indoor scenes, for, for kind of NYU type of scenes? And, uh, and so we were curious too. The problem is there's, there's really no training data uh, available for it because we want to see the objects from the front and the back. Uh, and so th there was, uh, so Guo and, and Derek Hoyam had, um, 
made this kind of synthetic version of NYU. So this data set is, uh, you know, quite a, quite a lot of effort went into it. Um, but we used that to train. So we would still take the real depth images as input from, from NYU, but then uh, we would use that kind of blocky version as, as the training data of the volume occupancy. And so here you can see uh, that the, the results are still better than Zhang. It's still better than the competition. And you can kind of see that the, the robot would know how to navigate to move behind the bed uh, and between that and the, and the wardrobe. Uh, and so there's, there's, there's sort of enough information to operate. I wouldn't say it's a very clean result yet and, and could still be improved. Uh, we can still tell that there's, a, you know, there's an empty space inside, cavity inside the bathtub. You certainly get a lot more information than, than just from your raw depth image. Um, or from, from Zeng at all. Because naturally, you know, Zeng, it, it's hard to segment a scene where, you know, there's a bathtub. You segment that and say it's a convex shape. So it's not surprising that Zeng isn't able to, to do very well there. Um, so uh, can we come back and say, okay, so how, how much have we really improved things? Uh, now we've got a single image compared to, to using multiple images. Um, and so here on the bottom right, you're seeing... Um, you're going to see our, represent, our depth, uh, our volume rep, uh, prediction for a single depth image. In the lower left, you're going to see increasing numbers of depth images being fused together. And so that's a single frame. Uh, and so obviously, you know, if there's only one frame available, you know, we're, we're clear, clear, clearly the winners. Um, but then even as you increase the number of inputs, uh, if you're just fusing the depth images, it takes a while before this input, this result starts looking like our result. So uh, at frame 38, you know, you could kind of say it, it's kind of close-ish, but, uh, but really it, it would help to capture, to keep going past this point to get a, a smoother result, a cleaner result, more like our voxlets that we get from a single image. Uh, we come back to our kitchen example, and so we had this single depth image, um, and now using this algorithm, right, we can complete that. And it improves most of the objects. Notably, though, it reveals the limitation of if the glass part of the coffee maker wasn't captured, it's not going to get fixed by this algorithm. Right? The, the volume is still missing, um, so there's still a gaping, gaping hole there. Uh, right. OK. So some, some future opportunities for this part of the work right, is maybe, oh, sorry, yes. Um, sorry, so um, if you uh, have, say, Two ob one object in front of another one, so the bottom half of it's occluded. Yes. Then how are you reconstructing that with your normal, uh, like I'm thinking of like the bottom half of a box or something. It seems like you would never reconstruct that. Yeah. Is so that we right? have we had to train voxlets that were, uh, we have two types of voxlets. We have ones that are just regular ones that I've described, and the other ones are the hovering voxlets. So they're basically like things that you might see and how to complete that, that, that would go down, that would complete down to the ground. I see. So, uh, so, so you have a box that says there's this thing around it and then a different type that... So yeah, so if the normal voxlets, if you think of the normal voxlets as, as, as designed to tell you what sits behind a surface point, uh -huh. these voxlets are designed to tell you what sits below okay, a surface okay, point. Okay, okay. Yes? Does that make an assumption though, that everything is sitting on the table? It and makes we we it it does set, assume that everything is yes that's right. In in addition to the orientation, we we kind of we've already kind of we've bought we've paid that price already. We said uh, we assume we know the up. We assume there's a ground, um, and I guess this tells us we we know we don't know where it is, so we don't know how high it is. Uh, that that's why I'm kind of hesitating. So the, in the when you've got the head. Yeah. You haven't projected down from the widest point to the table. Uh, when we have the head, like the head is sitting behind something. Well, just even if the head was by itself. Yeah. The, at some point you've got a surface normal for here, and you've not projected the straight down, like, you know, the, the, the path beneath that yeah. just changes as it goes down. How the, I guess you've got quite a complicated description of what can be beneath the surface point. So our voxlets are uh, not just a ray along the line, they are a volume. And so when, if, I, if I visualize for you this completed scene, you would see a sprinkling of surface points that were used, not a dense every depth pixel was visited and used to make a prediction. 
So when we have these voxlets, you, you, you have a whole set of shapes. It's a pretty big block of, of voxels be, sitting behind it that we're predicting and, and uh, saying on or off or sign distance. And so it, it is, that's why it goes down, it goes back uh, you know, to some extent, and left and right. It, it is sort of a, a, a sizable chunk of space that we're explaining with that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, we swept the parameter of how big the voxlets, these, these representations should be, and sort of not surprisingly, you know, there is a, there's a kind of a sweet spot that if you're doing tabletop objects, you want the voxlets to be sort of big enough to kind of cover, uh, I'm kind of guessing here at the number, but like a third of the shape of the, the whole object. Um, but, but we found that it wasn't that sensitive, so we have, that's why we have some objects, we have a ver scenes where you have a variety of objects, big ones and, and little ones, and sort of one size was, was pretty much okay, because we had a variety. We automatically determined the voxlets, obviously. We determined that from the training set. And the voxlets uh, are also compressed, uh, so we, we ended up doing PCA to, to reduce the dimensionality of them because they're very high dimensional, so we kind of reduce the alphabet so the random forest isn't doing like this massive search. It's a little bit simplified. Yes? Did you look at having different sizes of voxlets combined together? Like, a, uh, like forcing them to, to have to, sp to span the space of sizes. No, we didn't. Um, yeah, it, it's a sensible thing to, to try to try to, to cope with variety of sizes, I agree. Um, yes, we, we've, we've, uh, we've started going towards, um, towards using a neural net representation to try to discover the, the, the voxlets, uh, and so that's kind of a work in progress. Um, I'll skip over the, the future work, but you get the idea. There are new data sets coming online, synthetic and real, um, and the code for the system is code and data are available online if anyone is, is interested. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about the other uh, single view problem that we, we're dealing with, and that is namely color to depth. So um, for indoor scenes, we've got you know, connect scans. For outdoor scenes like this, uh, things can be tricky. So our, uh, our intention is to convert a color image like this into a depth image like this, where hot means close and cold means far away. So the, uh, the problem itself is typically been approached in a supervised uh, fashion. So meaning is sort of obvious, but meaning you take a color input image and you have some ground truth depth image that you wish to estimate, uh, and you set up some kind of model that you train. Um, and when the model spits out a depth image, Right, you compare that to the ideal depth image, and you penalize if it gets the wrong answer. Right, uh, until the model is trained and you're and you're happy. Uh, so that is the way uh, Saxena did it with Make 3D, and uh, Derek Hoyam did it with Photo Popup. And uh, after they did these these things, which were just amazing, they were so cool. You know, converting a color image into into depth information. Um, I, I took up the, the, the mantle and thought, oh, great, let's, let's try this. Let's take more training data and try other scenes. And, you know, for various reasons, uh, it didn't work. And, and, and it wasn't clear to me why it didn't work. It wasn't clear if it was because of the, the quality of the depth data that I was using as supervision or maybe the capacity of the models that we were using, you know, for, for, for learning uh, this mapping from color to, to depth. Um, now, you know, the capacity problem obviously has changed a little bit. So now people are using CNNs as the, as the model. And so there's been a rash of papers. So um, Eigen and, and Fergus obviously kind of kicked this off again. So, this, you know, notice there's a bit of a gap in, in years here uh, when maybe I probably wasn't the only one uh, struggling. And, and a number of other papers now have, have looked at this and said, oh, you know, let's like put a neural network in there to do that, to do that mapping. And the results are... Are, you know, were definitely um, motivational. But they're not amazingly different. They're not a, a, a sort of a, a huge step forward, as, as big as you would think. And so we, we look back at the data. So most people are using Kitty data for, for these types of problems now. Um, and you think, well, great, Kitty is collecting color, you know, reasonably high quality images and, and depth. You know, this is a pretty expensive setup. Um, so can you tell what's wrong with this depth image? Um, 
besides the fact that it's missing a bus, uh, which is pretty bad, uh, it's, it's also uh, got this car superimposed. So the, the, the way they did the cars uh, for ground truth, this is, this is the ground truth that you're seeing on the bottom. Uh, they went onto the internet and found models of cars, uh, tried to match the same you know, make and model as close as possible, and then they manually inserted meshes, so those, those handmade meshes, into the scene to sort of, so, so that not every moving object, so they, they, they have a lot of moving objects that are missing, so people, pedestrians, buses, um, at, but, but the cars are usually captured, right, because they've, they've made sure, they've kind of curated that to make sure it's there. Now, you know, on the, on the surface this is uh, pretty tragic, but actually the, you know, the, the moving objects don't happen that much, the road, the, the, the static part buildings and things, you know, there's still enough there that the networks can, can learn. Um, and uh, I kind of wanted us to continue with, with depth images, you know, we've got, we've got the technology, right? But Clément, the uh, PhD student, um, he wouldn't listen, so he wanted to go outside. I mean, he's, he's French, you see. Um, and so he wanted to go outside, and he said, look, there are, all these, uh, there are all these cameras now coming out, increasingly technology available that, that gives you stereo. So you have two, two color images. You don't have a depth sensor necessarily. Maybe you do sometimes, but, but you definitely can get pretty cheap stereo footage. Why don't we work with that? And, and so uh, Z, Z et al. had this system. They were trying to generate um, sort of the other view, so you know, to, to, to convert mono to, to stereo. Uh, and they, they called it unsupervised, and it's a, it's a, little, bit, it's a little bit unfair to call it unsupervised, but let's, let's roll with it, right? Um, so th this, the Z method also, um, you know, and, and this now translates to what we did. They said, right, you can get a left and a right image, and you can talk about it not in terms of depth, but maybe we talk about it as disparity, right? It's just a scaled uh, inverse of depth. Um, and now you can talk about shifting of pixels, right? How, instead of talking about absolute depth, it's about how far does the pixel from the left image, does that same pixel shift, how much is it offset um, to map to the, to the right image. And so it's just a, a horizontal shift if you've rectified your images. And so it's a very sort of simple problem. It's our st classic stereo problem. But by having left and right, you can go back to uh, our original setup and say, oh, I want to learn to predict, not depth, but I want to learn to predict disparity such that I can reconstruct the other image. Uh, and Garg et al. did the same thing, actually. Uh, so they followed in, in, uh, in the steps, footsteps of Deep 3D. So this is uh, Garg, this is from um, Ian Reed's group uh, in Australia, right? And so let me kind of illustrate the, the common parts of this. And, and also this is now pretty much explaining our model. Um, so we still have a color input, this is a left input, and we have a right output. Instead of a depth that we're trying to explain, we have a ground truth right image that we're trying to explain. We still have a model that we're going to train, and the model is going to help convert our input into a disparity. Not a depth, but we know, we know there's a nice simple inversion to convert from disparity to, to depth. Now, when we output that disparity, we still can't compare it to the ground truth right image. But we can synthesize a new right image based on that disparity. We can take the pixels from the left image, shift them according to the disparity map, and synthesize a new right image. Check if the synthesized matches the real right image, right? And if it does, great. Hopefully that means your disparity in the, there in the middle is correct. It's not entirely correct. We'll find out in a, in a moment. But it, 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 it is, that's the idea. So your loss function is now just on color similarity between your, your real and, and generated uh, right images. And we have to give our label to our disparity, right? This is actually uh, a right disparity. So it's the disparity, because there's a lot of left and right in this, in this talk, you see. Um, it's the disparity that maps pixels from the left image into to generate a right image. Now, uh, there's a slight problem with that. It, it, the problem is, I've come, to, I've come to you, this algorithm, I said, here's a left image, give me a depth. And it gives us, if we invert that R, that R depth image, I said, give me a depth for the left image, and it gives me a depth for some other image, right, for the, for the right view. Uh, it's not what I wanted, right? I wanted a depth image that goes with this left image. 
uh, and so we have, to, we have to flip things around a little bit so we, we instead compute a left disparity from the left image, right? I'm just going back and forth. And we're going to sample from the right image at training time only to then synthesize a fake left and compare it to the real left. Okay, so hopefully you see it's not a shell game. I've just done a regular substitution, right? But the, the, the payoff is now when you give me a left image, I'm going to get an along the way, a left disparity, which I can then infer to give you a left depth image, a depth that matches your input image. The right only serves for training purposes, right? And if I use its pixels, shift them according to this disparity, synthesize the left, and I'm happy with that, great. At test time, obviously that's not there. I can still produce disparities that I can invert. Yes? Just out of curiosity, did you try training a uh, kind of an autoencoder of some variety to go from the left to the right and then seeing what internal representation it built? No, we didn't. Okay. It is, it is an interesting idea. Uh, not, not trivial, but interesting uh, to, to explore, yes. Um, so with that approach, we have kind of replicated what uh, Garg uh, had, had done. And this is the result. Now, we got excited because we said, oh, you know, it's kind of, we're on the scoreboard now. You know, we're kind of, kind of making progress. But it's not great. You have a lot of these kind of um, cloning or ghosting kind of, kind of problems. Um, and our result, ultimately, that we, that we achieved looks more like this. Right? So if you compare theirs versus ours, there's a, there's a bit of improvement. So we have to come back here and, and see what, what, what was going wrong. Uh, and my summary of it is, this is, all I've done is just shifted the, I've just stretched this, the same, the old diagram down a little bit, right? So we had the same left disparity being generated and we're going to use the right for, for synthesizing our, um, our other view. The problem is that when you have, uh, that you can synthesize, you can synthesize a left image. Let's just go ahead here. Um, I'll go back. You can synthesize a left image like this one even while getting the disparity slightly wrong. For large regions of uniform texture, you could get the disparity quite a bit wrong and still generate a realistic looking left image. And, and actually, and I'd encountered this before when, when I was doing compression, right? There were, there were algorithms designed, this is hardware actually designed for, uh, this is kind of maybe slightly tangential, algorithms designed to do MPEG-4 compression which would try to do optical flow. But they didn't need to do correct optical flow. They didn't actually have to tell you where every pixel moved to from frame to frame. They just had to come up with a plausible way of reconstructing frames by, by encoding uh, an image and then where, it should move, where the pixel should move to later. So there are these sort of cheats. And the problem was that, that the network was learning kind of the path of least resistance, how to generate a left image without actually getting the disparity right. So what we did is we made the network work harder. It still has to produce the left disparity, but we made it also produce the right disparity. We do, ran the two processes in parallel, so it has to produce both the right and the left. Notice, right, it's always using, to make that left image, it's using pixels from the right, and to make that right image, it's using pixels from the left. Uh, You've you got to keep track of your left and right indices here. Um, and then we compare that so we can say, okay, What's the loss on the reconstruction? So you have to get both images right, which is not trivial. It means that also it gives us an opportunity to compare the disparities. And while you might get the, the disparity kind of right or close to reasonable by accident, it's hard to accidentally produce two disparities that agree with each other, that basically are saying, yes, I, this is the right depth for that, for that object, for that point. Uh, in the same way. So being, it's easy to be wrong in different directions. It's hard to be wrong in exactly the same direction. And so this extra loss really, uh, really helped us quite a bit. Um, there's actually a third term. So this is, our, this is our loss overall, right? It's based on the appearance matching of the generated images. It's based on the consistency, this third term that I've just mentioned, the left-right consistency. In the middle, we also have uh, a, smoothness, uh, a smoothness loss. So we're saying we want the disparities to be reasonably uh, kind of smooth, not to, not to, not, no po points as islands. Yes? You have to register the two disparities then? Yes. So our transformer, yeah. So there's, there's a, a little bit more to discuss in our network. There's, we transform the disparities just like we transform the pixels. 
we, we, it's the same process though, we actually, so we, it's just, it takes the matrix and it's the same transformation. So the disparity is being used to move, one, one disparity mapping is used to map a hypothesized disparity. Uh, yes, it, it is, it, it, it's, it's pretty simple as long as you keep track of the indices. Um, so uh, our results then, uh, you see those at the bottom and you see Garg's kind of the state of the art uh, in, in the middle there. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully you see that ours are, are looking a little bit more in focus. You know, you get the, the shapes uh, shaped correctly, at least a little bit closer to, to right. Um, and it's true across different scenes. These are all driving scenes. These are all outdoors. Um, and then, uh, you know, we evaluate with and without our left-right consistency check. So uh, you can kind of see the, the difference between the top and the bottom there or sampling points you know, from a given scene. So hopefully the, the, the right version of the blue square and the red and the green should all, should all look better. Sometimes it makes very little difference, like here in the middle, but usually, uh, usually it helps a little bit also. Um, our uh, smoothness term, uh, we use that on top of deep 3D because that was a previous, uh, a previous method that uh, you know, was, was competitive for, for a while. Uh, and that made a huge difference. So actually, if you're going to use Deep 3D, definitely add the smoothness because uh, that improves you from the sort of the top uh, color map here to the middle one. Um, but, then, but then ours with this left-right consistency and the other ingredients is actually uh, better still. Um, I won't go into the numbers, but we win. Um, the, 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 the thing maybe to say here is it, people got into this and, and the data sets that exist, so K is for Kitty, um, CS is for cityscape, Cityscapes. Um, it got kind of Wild West-ish in terms of different people using different splits of the data and how they crop their results and some people using like sometimes the left, sometimes the right image um, and, and so kind of getting, bringing order to all of this was, was tricky. Also, people, different people re reported different criteria, different um, sort of calculations for cal quantifying their results. So we just did them all. So we got all the data sets for this problem that we could get, used all of the criteria that existed, and evaluated all of them. Um, and we, we, you know, like for like, we win. So if we train on Kitty like everyone else did, we, we have better superior scores. If we train, um, if we train on Cityscapes uh, and Kitty, then we get even better scores. Um, there's a, a slight talking point there on the, the stereo version of ours where you actually keep both inputs, but, but that's not, we, let's not talk about that now. Um, we, mostly we just deal with one input. Um, there's also Kitty, the, what we call the Eigen split. So, so in fact, uh, the way he split the data, he's only using, uh, for testing, he's only 5% um, only of the pixels are being evaluated for, for depth. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting metric to use. And, and so here, um, we're, we're also coming out, uh, coming out ahead, even, <coughs> even without the post-processing, but, but certainly with a, 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 an ounce of post-processing that I can explain offline if needed. Um, there's also uh, a question of how do we generalize? So if you train on these driving scenarios, we do well. Uh, how well do we do on these scenes of Stanford campus, um, for instance, with Make 3D? And so in the top of the box, you see all the asterisks indicate algorithms that are supervised, fully supervised and trained on Make3D. Make3D doesn't have left and right pairs. So we just trained on Kitty uh, and, and that's, that's how we built our system. So numerically, we come out uh, less well, right? So it, it's, it's not, the story isn't as, as happy for us here. Uh, although I would argue, you know, we're with post-processing, our number here at the bottom uh, are, are not, far off of sort of uh, Karsh's methods um, from Illinois. Uh, but then if you look at the, the results visually, I would say I'm less embarrassed basically. Uh, you know, we didn't have access to, to domain data that's relevant. We didn't have supervision. Um, our results are there on the far right. Here you've got the, uh, the, input, the input scenes, sort of the, the two, the top and the bottom. Um, I, I would say that qualitatively, uh, we're, we're not so bad. I think there's a, there's a question of how, how much we trust the, the, ground truth, um, the ground truth data here. But um, anyway, I, I'm not saying it generalizes splendidly, but, but for outdoor scenes like Kitty, we've kind of seen scenes like this. Uh, I think the algorithm uh, ha stands a chance. In, in essence, you could think of what we're doing as a kind of indirect 
object recognition, right? If you see, if you see a person uh, and they're about they, yay big in your color image, then they're probably about yay far away. And, and I think that kind of uh, applies also to other objects that, that we're seeing. Um, there are, we, like I said, we tried every kind of data set, so maybe I'll just show you the, uh, the video, the cityscapes uh, data set comes up first. Right, so you're seeing two outputs at the same time, so uh, just to kind of get through it faster. I mean, we're, we're processing frame after frame, so each frame is processed individually. There's no temporal coherence in the algorithm. So any kind of, you know, uh, any kind of inconsistencies would appear as flicker. This should look familiar to some of you. This is driving around, uh, this is driving around Cambridge. Um, in John Wynn's car, right? In John Wynn's car. This was, this was uh, yes, one of these is John Wynn's car, the other one was a rental car because John wasn't available that day, but yes. Uh, and this is just walking around, so this is slightly more freeform, um, you know, going into the park and, and uh, you know, things that necess weren't necessarily in Kitty or, or cityscapes. So, um, Basically, we've tested on every scene we, we could find, uh, and the results look um, reasonably, reasonably happy for, for us. Uh, oh, let me go to the team view here. Yep. There we go. So the code is available online today. Uh, we, we, uh, we had to put some licensing information in there because we, we have now uh, been filed and, and actually gotten sort of the, the initial filing, uh, the UK approval. Um, and we're trying out the algorithm for other settings, so capturing other data sets. The occlusion boundaries are, I would say, the place for the greatest improvement. So um, if we have a second, we have, we have a second, right? Yeah. One, um, here, we've got, uh, here we've got our a single input color image. Um, 600. 600, great. So we, can, we, we, can, we take a color image from the Kitty data set. And this is the depth that we're, that we're estimating for that scene. And now we're just wobbling the head kind of back and forth in a prescribed, prescribed fashion. And so you can kind of see that occlusion boundaries aren't, they're, they're sharp enough. But when we, try to, um, when we try to generate other views, so I go back to the color version, uh, you can say, see what, what I call skirts, right, that, that we don't necessarily just chop the, discont the depth discontinuity. We, we have a bit of a smooth transition that the network is, is outputting. So some of these objects that should, like the, the, the posts on the road, you know, that should be nice and sharp are, are leaving a little bit of a, um, yeah, they're, they're kind of a, a gradual transition from foreground to background. And, and you can jump around, you can go anywhere in the, in the Kitty data set um, and see the, see the results. Also, the, the, the left and right extreme boundaries are, are harder because during the training data, um, every input is paired with another, like a, a left input is paired with a right input. And so that means that you have kind of, uh, you have depth information or the, the parallax information for things in the middle of the scene, but for things on the periphery, you don't, you don't have, the, the other camera doesn't see that, and so you can't, it's hard to train for those. Um, so in a way, you might not want just left and right. You might want sort of an array of cameras, you know, spanning a, a you know, a beam, the, the width of a car, if you're going to drive around with it. Um, and I mean, if people want to play, we can come up. You can come up later and look at uh, at cityscape scenes and and um, you know evaluate uh, evaluate the, the results. But any, you know, I, I'm pretty happy with all of the frames. You know, there aren't there aren't sort of secret bad ones that we're that we're hiding. Um, Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think we have plenty of time for questions, so... Yeah, Hi, Sebastian. A, a simple technical one, perhaps it was addressed not in your work, but earlier already, but it's, um, how in this, when you do the remapping, so you output a disparity map, yeah. and then you, there's a simple function that maps it to, to, to the other view. Um, but is that differentiable, or do you have to play any tricks there? Yes. To yeah. So we we use the, the we used the Oxford method for for transforming it so that it was differentiable, and that was um, it was a point of of contention because 
in Garg's paper, they initially said there wasn't differentiable. And, that's, and we thought, oh, that's why ours is so much better. But actually, theirs was differentiable, in fact. So, so uh, it helps. It, it, you have to have it. But, but, um, but that isn't the secret sauce for us, as it turns out. Yes? Uh, in the video of the round about, it looked like there was a lens artifact being interpreted as, as death. Uh, how do we deal with that? Uh, or, or, do you, or is that an issue? Yeah, I, just, I totally agree it's an issue. I wouldn't want to drive around in a car that, that suddenly says, ah, you know, <laughs> big vertical object in the middle of the road. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it wasn't, you know, I could, I could weasel out of this question and say, oh, it wasn't in the training data. You, you know, it's your fault for not putting it in the training data. But the fact is, it's just, it's very hard, right? If, if it looks like a shape and it's a per frame algorithm, then it's, it's doomed, right? It's going to think your, your Tesla or whatever is going to slam on the brakes because there it is. Uh, I, I, I can go back to the video if someone wants to see the, the frame he's talking about, but it, it is, it is bad, right? It suddenly thinks there's an object right in front of you. Yes? So the ground truth for the last stuff you showed there was based on a, a binocular view, and then you were, is that, is that what you're doing there? So the ground truth I was showing for the Make 3D, um, that's, the only, that's the most recent ground truth I showed. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's from, that is from a laser scanner, I think. So I think but in the walk around stuff you were doing in Cambridge, that was, that was comparing uh, binocular view, so a two image view, a left and right image view as the ground truth versus a single image view. Was that the... I was, yeah, so for the Cambridge data set, it, it's just single view input images. And so, um, so we were just testing on that and, and generating depth images from, from those. Uh, the, the, indeed, the training for that was left right views uh, from from Kitty and from and Cityscape, so we use the the, com the bigger training set for for that result. Yes. Okay. So in stereo, it's it's pretty well known that if you have very high res images, everything becomes easier because you get like pick up on micro textures and so on for matching. So so is it the hope that because everything in the end is just a feed forward neural network that you could apply this to whatever sixteen megapixel images and everything will just magically work and all the depth seclusion boundaries and everything will be like amazing or do, what are the real bottlenecks and, or, or obstacles in, in just collecting a, a bunch of data? Or are we have we've stood up and said and I guess I'm going I'm being recorded now to saying yeah it's about getting large quantities of data um, and that it is less about resolution in our case and more about recognition so you want scenarios that look that look familiar uh, because it's not a matching process, mm -hmm. it, it, it is more about familiarity that this general appearance, and we are multi-scale. This, this whole network is implemented as a, uh, at multiple scales. Um, so it is more about the, the context of the shape rather than the texture of the shape. So higher resolution images would not be my first choice for expanding the data set, um, but greater variety, large quantity of images, different viewing angles, that's, that's, that's our top priority. Yeah, talking about viewing angles, it looks like those pictures are taken from a higher viewing vantage point than the training data which is mounted. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised actually now that you say that because this was done person walking around campus, uh, Stanford campus, whereas the driving ones are mounted yeah, I mean, in the car. It just looks like you think stuff is closer. Well, you're basically right, but your depth, yours comes out. Ah, you think we have a bias because of the, the viewing angle? Yeah. Ah, I hadn't even, hadn't even thought of that. How do you know there's no color bar? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, that was our secret. So we the didn't... entire scene could just be a scaled down world, right? Yeah. Um, well, but there's, there's, scaled up world. It's, it's absolutely the question I, I, I'm always asking, right? Because are we looking at a Barbie world or a real world, right? Because it could be just a, a conversion factor in scale. Yeah. And, and, okay, so a limitation that we have right now is that because we do this left and right and they go through parallel, um, we, all our training data has to come with the same disparity. And so, exactly, it's that fixed camera setup. So you can cap, we can pump through easily, cheap to get data, but all the data has to come from the same stereo rig setup. And, and is that always mounted at the same height in practice? 
So it's not. So cityscapes and kitty have different heights uh, of, of mounting. Not drastically different, but one's on top of the roof, the other one is sort of lower down in the, in the frame of the car. Um, but we are, and, and we've adapted the baseline, so we take one data set and re-render re the images so that it, it matches the other, so that we could put both into the same network. But we're working on that, and so that, that is actually, um, that's kind of it's a preview. It's working, right, uh, to, to go different, to have welcome data sets of different baselines. But the, the, the question of height, I think, is, is interesting because it's, if we're biasing based on height, <coughs> that will be... Uh, that will, that will be a problem, right? Um, one could argue that, you know, if we were to start combining multiple frames to take multiple depth images, sorry, multiple color images as input, we could start adapting, you know, a bit uh, in terms of scale and say, okay, well, I've got a, some kind of Procrustes problem. I've got a prediction for the depth. Can I, can I match that and, and, and twist it to, to map the, to, to this particular scene? Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about it. It's a good question. Yes. Would it be really difficult to have a sort of up-down version of your left-right that you were talking about? Yeah, earlier? yeah. Uh, so we we are thinking about that in part. So I'm showing you all my cards because um, because uh, I would like to do 360 um, because that's when you really have trouble doing stereo, right? You, you know, it's just physically difficult. But the only way you can do stereo with 360 is exactly as you say, top top down. So. Um, and, th and then we have to do that, exactly. I, don't, I can't say it's, it's, it's like coming because we haven't started it, but we are, we are kind of planning it, yeah. Yes? So in the, in the first part of your talk, um, you uh, were focused on single image, but there's sort of nothing inherent about it that has to limit it to single image, right? Like That's you could right. do a better job of reconstructing in the connect fusion scenario as well, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and did you guys look at that at all, or is that something you? It, we we stopped just just shy of it. Basically, we we tried doing a, computing a descriptor based on two images that were kind of nearby, and it wasn't like we. It seemed that if they were really close to each other, the two input images, then it didn't really help, obviously, because it wasn't giving a lot of new information. And then as we got further away. It did help, but then, then the, the baseline was getting way better. Right, exactly. So that there you, you're, yeah, the, so you it's get getting away from you, right? The, the gains go yeah. down pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about what we what we have talked about is a um, like a next best view planning system, because that would be kind of interesting. There there are standard metrics for that that we could just just use and say, all right, for next best, where does my robot go to get the next best view? And and there are winners and losers and benchmarks. Um, but we, but we don't have a platform, like a physical platform for, for capturing, and so we, we'd have to, we'd do it, we could do it in simulation. I mean, you could take your existing data and pick another few Yes, exactly. Uh, that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It's, it's, pretend that our robot went to that angle and then, okay, okay. yeah. I thought you meant simulated vision of, or, or graphics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other burning questions? I'm available offline as well. Yeah, so. of course. Yes. Yeah. Let's uh, thank Gabe again. And, uh, thank you very much.